Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that'll help you make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. And it is Monday, the 11th of December. We've got a ton of stuff as usual. Uh, we're going to do things in a bit of a different order, though. Christoph tells me that the most interesting part of our regular episodes is the King of the Jungle update. So we're going to go first with that this week. And we have both done stuff. So keen to talk about what we have done and why I'm even further ahead than I was, I'm sure. Oh, the spoiler. The spoiler <laughs> word. <laughs> what else? We've got some other people sitting on the edge of their, of their couches <laughs> wondering, when will Monkey finally pull ahead for good? Not yet. Not yet, folks. I, I want to make it a little more interesting, infuse a little bit of hope into Badger's spirit before taking him down. But yes, he's a little ahead. Uh Christoph, you picked up an interesting comment in the movie Dumb Money. We're going to explore that, and you're going to teach me a little bit about options and risk, I guess. Yes, sir. Uh, something called Theta DK. And then we're going to talk about a really intriguing conversation you had with your tennis coach about a legitimate fraud scam that he fell for and red flags that all investors ought to consider. Yeah, my buddy Dan, uh, he fell for something that um, looked really legit and he did his due diligence. It looked good and it went really badly wrong. Uh, we'd like to tell you a bit about that. And we think there's a couple of investing red flags that any investor should be aware of. Yes, absolutely. So shall we talk about the, uh, the latest changes to our Wall Street wildlife portfolios? Show us that beautiful graph. Let me see how far ahead my badger <laughs> line is now. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is painful at the moment, but, but am I worried, friends? Ask me if I'm worthy. Bar badger, do you think I'm worried? You don't look worried. Are you worried? I am absolutely not worried. I have zero. I don't. Not a single bone in my body is, wor <laughs> is worried. I have you exactly where I want you. So, can okay. you see uh, the screen? Yes, I can. Looks beautiful. I like it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as of Friday's close, the Badger has an account value of one thousand one hundred and ninety-four dollars, and your humble monkey is at $968, showing a negative return at the moment. Badger, what did you do to your portfolio recently? Uh, just today, on the Monday, I invested that 100 bucks I talked about last week, and I bought a about half a share, fractional trading, love this stuff. Uh, it's working out really well in this fancy app I'm using. I bought a fractional share in Axon, uh, A-X-O-N, ticker. And I'm not sure if I've talked about Axon on this podcast before. It's one of my highest conviction companies. Uh, they're kind of in law enforcement. They um, invented the taser uh, to sort of take down perps. Uh, they also have a range of cameras. You stick in um, police vehicles, uh, flying cameras, drone cameras, um, fleet cameras, like body cameras. We've got these cameras uh, on British Transport Police in the UK. Uh, you see them on bouncers uh, at uh, nightclubs. They're typically Axon cameras, uh, but behind all of that fancy hardware, which is all market leading stuff, they've got some beautiful uh, architecture they call evidence.com. They link all this stuff together and it just makes uh, law enforcement's time much more efficient, much more optimal, so easy for police officers to capture what's happening at the scene of a crime uh, or an incident and then aggregate all that information redact innocent bystanders and computer screens that might have you know sensitive information on them and then get it into the hands of the court system so um just makes it much more efficient and i'm a big fan and supporter of um all of the police forces around the world and if you can make their lives a little bit easier it's a super tough job then that's a thumbs up in my book highly ethical investment and just one last thing i'll say um founder rick smith has a moonshot goal over the next 10 years, by the 2030s, of halving 
gun-related death in the US. And it's a big problem, uh, I suppose, in Texas, where you're based, a particularly big problem. So, hey, that's no bad thing. Mm. I love the story of this one, Badger. Uh, <clears throat> but can I push back in, in one, uh, push back only in the open sense? A story does not necessarily make a good investment. So out of all the interesting stories out there or interesting companies, why this one? Well, are you worried? Uh, oh, maybe a follow-up to that is, are you worried about its valuation? Uh, I'm not. It's, it's relatively expensive. I don't have the numbers right in front of me. But I like the fact that it's uh, free cash flow generating, it's financially self-sustaining, and uh, growth from their biggest segment, it, like U.S. law enforcement, is just really nice like they're growing at a nice steady compounding rate um yeah i've got limited concerns about this one like i would worry about valuation in a difficult macro climate which we might be coming into who knows um for companies that are not financially self-sustaining any company that's got significant levels of debt um or they're just not yet operating income positive or free cash flow generating that could be a like a tough world could be tough on those kind of companies so the stuff that's highest conviction in my portfolio pretty much uniformly uh, is master of its own destiny. It's got money to throw around and invest in interesting acquisitions, uh, which Axon did quite recently, acquiring a, uh, a little European tech firm that's helped bolster their, um, their armament. Yeah, it's a great company. I think you're going to do well with this uh, over a longer period of time. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit uh, skeptical at the moment of buying any company that is richly valued. I think I see the macro conditions as much more dire, uh, in that the the cracks will start getting wider in the near term. So, uh, I worry that even a great company like Axon will ha will suffer a challenging fate in the next, uh, however many months to a year to two. So we shall see. But I do love the ethical piece of, of Axon for sure. Yeah. Hey, look, I will sidebar a little bit because uh, you and I have been chatting macro and uh, your buddy, Mr. Nod of Vice, has got a pretty uh, bearish take on where the world might be going over the next couple of quarters. You did put the fear of God in me a little bit, I will say. Now, I haven't touched my intuitive surgical stake, but because um, I, I just swore on last week's podcast, I'm not touching that damn thing until it gets to at least 20% of my portfolio and it ain't there yet. But I have actually um, increased my cash allocation in my personal portfolio from about just under 15% to over 20%. So I'm kind of battening down the hatches. So kind of hope I don't need that, but I just do feel... Given your comments the last couple of weeks, I feel a little more secure having a bit more cash under the mattress. Right, and that, that's such a key component of investing is the, I call it the sleep well quotient. And any time I've erred seriously, it's been I've erred by taking too much risk. And how did I know it was too much risk? Because my mind at night would actually have anxiety, dreams, or, or worries. And that's a telltale sign, you know, because... It's it's the irony of investing. Often, I think where sometimes if you, the more you know, the more confident you get, uh, the larger risk you're willing to take. And I'm speaking for myself. And but but then you overextend, and then anything can happen, and often it does. But yep. uh, Badger, I I applaud this company entering your portfolio. It's just the timing that I'm I'm uh, suspicious of. And as I say that. I'm suspicious of my own suspicion of timing because as a, <laughs> as a long-term buy-and-hold investor for the majority of my, my life, I know that that's typically something you ought not to finagle with or, or try to mess with too much. Just uh, these these current circumstances make me sing. I'm singing a different tune, basically. So, you know, I feel a little wobbly uh, saying that. But so it is. We shall see. So what have you done in your own portfolio, Christoph? Meanwhile, uh, Badger, you will be uh, you will be disappointed in me for 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 increasing my allocation to Coherus yet yet again. <laughs> but I did it in a I did it in a different way and for a different reason. I continue to be uh, uh, highly confident 
that they will receive another FDA approval within the next, call it 30 days, 30 to 60 days, and that the market will react positively to that. But more so, but beyond that, that tower, that stacking tower of positive inflection, uh, cash flow inflection points will begin showing up in the next quarter. And so uh, starting January, there's an FDA drug that they're selling that's going to go in the market. If they get this FDA approval, that's another thing. Basically, there's a lot of bottlenecks that are about to be resolved. If, if I'm right that the stock is severely undervalued at this point based on the financials, then I wanted to leverage that opportunity. And so instead of buying shares outright with my cash, I bought one call, one May 17th, 24 call at the $4 strike price for Coherus Biosciences, and I paid $35 for it. That allows me, in essence, to control 100 shares of Coherus until the May 17th uh, deadline. So my thesis is that between now and May, we will see quite an inflection point in the business operations and that shares will be re-rated. And so if I, if I were to use those $35 to buy shares outright, I think they're going for, call it 220 a share. So that would get me how many shares? Like 10, 15-ish? Right, I could with thirty-five dollars, I could have bought fifteen shares. Whereas using this option, I'm controlling a hundred, so I'll, I'm increasing my leverage by about. Uh, I don't know what the math is on that times four four x over shares yeah, outright. Three, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And and typically, it's important to know. Typically, most call options expire worthless. Ninety percent of them expire worthless. So the only time I will buy calls is when I have uh, done what I would consider massive amounts of due diligence on the company and I really understand, I feel I understand, I know something sort of deep in the weeds that the market in general is overlooking. And you get that kind of insight by, you know, uh, your eye you know where to look, I guess, I suppose, in the corners of, of the internet. You're either an expert in the industry or you're following someone that knows what they're talking about and you've done your research, but you do not take these kinds of gambles on a whim simply saying, I think it's going to go up. You really have to have a, a, a strong reason for it. So, and, uh, I, yeah. and, I, so you, and you've bought this in the face of what's potentially a bit of bad market news because I saw in the last week or two Coherus's uh, CFO, Chief Financial Officer, has quit or announced he's leaving the company. And that, that can be a red flag in itself. The guy's only been there for a couple of years. So how did that factor into your doubling down decision? Yeah, uh, when I first saw the news, it's one of those, uh, it's not a sinking feeling exactly, but one of those like, oh damn, like uh, here's another obstacle. It doesn't read great. But after looking into it, this guy, the, the CFO, seems to be of a company jumper. Uh, and there was nothing, put it this way, um, it's kind of like the way I think of insiders buying and selling shares, that a buy means something, but a sell, you could be selling for all kinds of reasons. And even though it looks negative on the surface, you really don't know. And this is the bucket I put the CFO's departure in. Like, not great, it's certainly not a positive, uh, but the company's finances are in fine shape and everything else I know about the company overrides the departure of this CFO. So I shaded it for myself kind of like a neutral to slightly negative tone that does not come anywhere close to outweighing the positives that I see upcoming okay and, and when are we going to see your catalyst do you think at what point does your uh stock chart leap into the lead and become unassailable by me well see that's the other in interesting thing about why i'm using options uh strategically 
is that it's important to understand you do not need to wait until May for the benefits, the leverage to accrue. So one of the things many people don't know about options is that they're composed of something called IV, which is uh, implied volatility. And that's mathematically based depending on all kinds like statistics and uh, prices and basically what the market thinks, the, the rate of change that the option can undergo. I think of it more simplistically as an accelerator. It's the, the higher the IV of an option, which you could find on most platforms. If you open the options page, you'll see it's a stat like that's front and center. The higher that number is, you could think of it, the more likely that the price will accelerate either up or down for that option. So it's like, are you driving a sports car or are you driving a dune buggy? You know what I'm saying? And so the uh, the interest of the IV on coherence options are is quite high. And that's because we know that, especially in biotech, there's FDA approvals and all kinds of things that, that make leaps in price entirely possible. So to answer your question, because I know there's an FDA approval around the corner, literally it could be any day now, that usually... Uh, that's one of the reasons that the stock price can jump. But I foresee the inflection points for the company as a whole to come around their next earnings call uh, sometime in February. Okay. All right. Let's, let's see. Look, look forward to March's episode and we'll see what happened. Okay. <laughs> all right. right on. So, uh, all right. So we were, so you've been talking options and why don't we go a little bit deeper and you can tell us a bit about something called um, theta. And this was a quote from the movie Dumb Money. Um, Strap on your theta dildo and start pounding. Was, <laughs> that uh, sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so go and pound my ears with some explanation. What is theta and why is it a dildo? Yeah, so th this goes to answer why I chose May 17th as opposed to, say, January or uh, or or February. In the options world, options are typically not set up to benefit the individual investor. The people who profit from options typically are the sellers. They're the market makers, especially if you're buying calls. So understand that 90% of options expire, call options expire worthless. It's the people who sold them to you that make the money. And one of the reasons, one of the ways they profit is by something called theta decay when the value of the option decays, literally drops with each passing day. So the closer, the closer you are to the expected event, the less likely it's going to happen. You want there to be lots and lots of time for your predictive thing to happen. Right. If I if I say to you that Coherus uh, is expecting an FDA approval, but I only have two days left on the option. Well, the odds of that happening in two days is very, very low. So yeah. options contracts take into account that with each passing day, their value goes down. And there's there's a mathematical formula to all of this in the rate at which option theta decay comes into play uh, accentuates or accelerates about three weeks out. Approximately three weeks from today, you'll see theta increasing. That means you, if you're holding that option, it's going to start losing value faster and faster. So the rule of thumb I would advise everyone to follow is if you want to take the more risky and aggressive leveraged route of buying something like a call option, you do not, under most circumstances, buy a call that is less than two months from your predicted event. If you do, you are setting yourself up to be pounded by the dildo called Theta DK. It's, <laughs> it's setting yourself up for an unpleasant experience. 
So bring it back to your uh, coherence then. So your, uh, you think we'll start seeing some of these uh, like FDA announcements in an earnings call that's a couple of months prior to your May option expiry date. Because at that point, that's when like the brick wall starts approaching and you put your foot on the gas. Correct. So I'm basically saying to myself that I think it's now early December. My options expire in May. That's about six months from now. That even though I think there's going to be a bunch of good news in the coming month or two, I still have built an additional four months of leeway into my strategy. So even if I'm wrong and things usually take longer than they take, uh, I, time that time factor won't kick in until April. And by then, my claim is in this moment that the market will have re-rated Coherence higher by April. Great. Good. All right. Thanks. I feel like I learned something there. Yeah. So theta is bad. Stay, kids, stay away from, from the theta dildos. <laughs> There are other ways, there are other fun ways to get your, to get your uh, rocks <laughs> off. <laughs> well, I've, I, and I've, I'm watching several options I own expiring worthless, like this week. I think I've got some December calls on something that I've taken my eye off and might be in Vitae. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess that's Theta doing its work on me. I didn't realize that I was getting pounded in that way from behind. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so maybe that's why you're usually grinning. <laughs> <laughs> cool beans. Well, I'm really looking forward to getting to our interview that I recorded a few days ago with my buddy. Um, but before we do that, like we, we're here uh, sharing the insights into how we run our own portfolios, giving you some lessons in how to avoid getting scammed. If you want to return the favor to Christoph and myself, no better way to do that than by uh, giving us a like, subscribing if you're on our YouTube channel uh, or if you're on one of the podcasts with us and uh, telling a friend because uh, we are still super small beans. We got, I don't know, 50 something subscribers on YouTube. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get the theta, theta dildo pumping that number up a little bit. That's, that's right. If we can't get this video going viral by all the talk about theta getting pounded by theta dildos, then, then we're hopeless. But yes, it's a, right now they're, they're, we need more critters in the jungle with us. So tell, uh, tell your family members, uh, tell your friends, uh, tell them about the King of Jungle portfolio contest. We got Team Monkey over here. We got Team Badger. There's all sorts of reasons to get tribal with us. So like and subscribe, as the kids say, or pound, smash, pound. <laughs> hey, pound, <laughs> and smash, pound, use your Theta dildo to pound the subscribe button. There you go. That's a better use for it. All right. So, All right. Badger, you, uh, you recorded a fascinating interview with a very likable, very... Uh, I, I think sincere friend of yours, who's your tennis coach, about uh, a really unfortunate incident where he got scammed for a lot of money, and it's really sad, really sad to hear something like like this. But unfortunately, it's it's one of these laws of the jungle. Uh, there there are all, all kinds of harmful beasts willing to prey who prey on people. Won't you tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, well, I mean, probably no better way, actually, than let's hear from Dan himself, and he'll tell us a bit about uh, what happened early a few months ago this year. Hey, guys, so today we've got a very special guest with us, one of my good friends, Dan, who has a fascinating and frankly quite eye-opening story to share about his recent experience in the world of investing. Dan, thanks for joining this episode of Wall Street Wildlife. You were recently, unfortunately, involved in an investment scam that I think many of our listeners could learn from. If you could kick off, maybe tell us a bit about the particular investment and what attracted you to it. So the things that attracted me to the, it, the world of investment in the first place was being um, a single dad to two young daughters um, with a pretty decent job, um, but was looking for a little something catcher in life, a little something to... Uh, buffer the pension pot, as it were, and, and to take care of myself as I get a bit older in years. Um, and so looking for different ways to invest the small amount of money that I had um, just seemed like a smart thing to do. 
Um, so I set about trying to figure out how and where I was going to invest my little bit of savings that I'd saved, um, and how I could how I could you know potentially make some money for for the future. Um, and that's when I stumbled across the lovely Nux Trade Trading Company, for which I went with. Okay, and what, what were Nux Trade? What do they do? What are they offering? So Nux Trade uh, were an investments company. Um, you know, trading obviously in everything that they do, um, and so uh, they kind of offered me the classic salesman pitch of you invest X and we'll help you produce Y, which looked very attractive. And so that's what kind of drew my eyes in at first was the amount of um, uh, potential gain of, it, of you know towards my investment that, that was there. And they were extremely confident when speaking to them about, about the process in how they how they go about it. So they were going to double your money over some short time frame, is that right? It started off, I think it was f- uh, for a thousand pounds investment. They could turn that into six thousand um, pounds in the first six weeks. Wow, that's a that's a very healthy return. That like Isn't it? most investors, I'm not going to overlook. But uh, so. So how was your experience? You know, you're looking forward to turning £1,000 into 6000 What was the process? What actually happened? So first of all, you, you uh, go through a process. You, they hook you up with a broker. Uh, the broker gets in touch. Um, that's once you've made your initial inquiry. Um, and then the broker talks to you about how the process works, about how the system works. So they first of all get you to download the Nux Trade app and stuff so that you can use it from your phone on the go, et cetera, et cetera. And then they show you how to use the platform and how to work your way and navigate your way around that platform so that it is easy for you. Um, and you only, as, a, as, the, as the customer, the client, I only make the trades that they advise me on. They obviously are the professionals in that field. And so they say, you know, just... Be wary, don't go crazy yourself, protect your money. Uh, we're there to look after it for you and therefore only do exactly what we tell you to do. These guys sound great, they sound like your best friends. They literally come across as sounding like they're going to solve all your problems for the rest of the work, you know, for, for your entire life. Um, and so, yeah, you do, you buy into that. You, you 100% you buy into what they are telling you. And when they take you through the stages of looking at the platform and running through it, how it all works. It is. It does look very professional. It sounds very professional. You know, they're clearly no monks themselves. And and how did you how did you get your money onto the exchange? So in order to get your money onto the platform, it's it was done through the Bitcoin wallet. So you open up a Bitcoin wallet, you transfer the funds to buy Bitcoin, da da da, and then and then from there you go from the Bitcoin wallet into the Nux trade account. So I started off with I just invested two hundred and fifty pounds. And because I was cautious to test the waters, I had the company checked out by a financial friend of mine who checked out that platform as well and thought it all looked legit and professional and stuff. Um, We asked if they were FSA regulated. Um, They said they weren't FSA regulated, but they were regulated through uh, like an international regulator um, of which they sent me all the documentation for and all the rest of it, which again, I had checked out and it all checked out. So I then thought, well, that's that's fine. And if they're regulated, it's you know, it's I didn't realise it was different. So yeah, so I started the the ball rolling, and I was I was making money. I, I was that two hundred and fifty pound. I was making thirteen dollars here, fourteen dollars there, twenty dollars here. It, small amounts of money. And of course, what they do is they say, well, you can see that it works, and you're making money. I didn't lose on any trade at any stage, and I did that for a month. So I thought I'd tested the waters, I'll stick a bit more money in. So then I stuck in an extra 750. So that was a thousand pounds of my money there. And I thought I'll give that a month and test the waters with that. And again, it came back. I never lost any trades. And of course the returns were were slightly more. There it was 30 to anywhere between 30 to 90 dollars on what we were investing. Um, they make it very clear that they never like to invest any more than. Thirty percent of your money at any given one stage, in order to protect your money. So it was it was quite interesting, but it was con- it was constantly making money. And one thing they try and do when you're making money is they 
they try to tempt you to take some money out so that you can see that it's really easy to withdraw your money at any stage you want. And you, you did that. So you made a withdrawal. You're like, this is legit. So I said, fantastic. Let's go through that process. So um, the process uh, of withdrawing the money again was through Bitcoin, the Bitcoin wallet. So uh, they, they take you through the steps. You open up the Bitcoin wallet. You transfer the money from the trade account to Bitcoin. And then what I did is opened up a, a Chase bank account in which I transferred the money from the Bitcoin wallet to my Chase bank account. Everything went through perfectly fine. And I thought, I mean, I only withdrew 250 quid. And I thought, this is great. You know, I can get, I can take my money out when I, when I choose to. Um, this, is, this is fantastic. So you got in a little deeper than £1,000 in the end, though. What, what actually happened? So as time goes on, obviously, they try to in, increase your money to increase your profits. Um, and it was about, I think it was 10 weeks in, I decided, right, okay, I've, I've tested the waters enough. I've taken out some money. That took in all the boxes. Let's, let's take the plunge. And so I ended up putting in another 9,000. So that was a 10,000, which was my, all my savings at the time. And I, I put that in believing that obviously I could turn that, they, they told me I would turn the 10,000 in the first year into somewhere between 27 to 30,000 in the first year. So at what point did the wheels come off? When did you start to think, actually, this isn't as legit as it looks? It started, the wheels started coming off pretty fast once I told them that I wasn't prepared to invest any more money than I had already invested. And it was at that point they then asked me to invest more money, to which I said I didn't have. My, my savings and my, my money was already in. Um, and they were convinced, trying to convince me to take out a £25,000 loan. So, that, so then alarm bells start ringing at that point. 100%. Alarm bells started ringing and I thought, I do not want to be £25,000 in debt. I've already got everything that I had saved in this in this account, um, it was doing well, but there was just no way. My kind of sensible hat came on, and there was just no way I was going to I was going to take out that money. And it was refusing to take out that twenty five thousand that they then became very pushy. Right. So your broker went from being your best buddy to what happened? So my broker was constant every every pretty much every day. We would have a phone call about how the account and stuff was going, or, or certainly every two days at, at most. Um, and he basically started to become very pushy and trying to get me to, 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 to sell it. Um, I told him I, absolutely under no circumstances this was going to happen. Then I started noticing that some trades were starting to fail for the first time. And when I started questioning that, it was at that point I was contacted by another broker from the same company who had informed me that the first broker that I used had mismanaged my account and that he would of course solve all my problems clean up the account correct everything that the previous broker had done told me that the broker was an idiot and he would take over my account for me and make sure that everything was back on track and i was making money but presumably you had to give this new guy some more cash to of course <laughs> of course the 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 the, the, the in order to get out of the hole that the other guy put me in, I needed to put in the £25,000 from the loan that the previous guy was trying to get me to take. Yeah. I was tempted. I, I, I genuinely, it genuinely sounded like this guy had mismanaged my account and that this guy was going to, to, to save me, as it were, and save my funds. Um, but thankfully, common sense kicked in and I chose to stick where I was. But yeah, when, they, when I didn't want to put in the extra 25000 they then became really quite aggressive in their tactics. Yeah. So were you able to recover any of that cash or is, is, have you now closed the account and finished business with them? So thanks to your great advice, um, I rechecked things over um, and decided to take out a little bit more money. I took out another £500, um, which they authorised. Um, and then I then decided I need to shut this down. I need to get out whatever I can and and cut my losses and and run. Um, and it's when I then tried to take out a large or more money or a larger sum of money that they then don't authorize the payments. Suddenly they're telling you 
they're giving you trades in which to catch back up on your money, those trades start to fail. So your money keeps going down and down and down and down to the, that's when I then stop trading completely. I try to cash out all the, close all the trades um, and then just leave with whatever was left and then withdraw that. And that wasn't authorized. And then suddenly out of nowhere, one morning I woke up and my account read zero. Having had this experience, is there any advice you give to others who maybe are having these conversations with, with, with brokers like this or are looking for investments that are going to 6x their money in six weeks? If I was to invest again, I would speak to somebody who's been there, done it. They've been able to draw out money. They haven't been scammed. They've perhaps been doing it for two or three years. It's been very successful. They know it's a legitimate and successful platform to use. Um, and I think that would give me greater confidence moving forwards. If I was to choose to invest, I would choose to invest with somebody that I knew it was already working for someone else. Very good. So has this experience affected your thoughts about investing, your perspective on investing? Yes, I, I would say definitely. I would say um, I felt I did my due diligence and, and worked out everything. It just goes to show that perhaps I didn't do it as thoroughly as what I should have. Um, would I invest again in the future? If I had the money, I think I would. I think I would invest if I had the money again. Um, I, I think I would just go about it very differently. Dan, that's really great. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Don't be put off investing. It is an incredible way to uh, make incredible returns. But if anybody tells you they're going to 6x your money, they're going to double your money in the course of a couple of weeks, well, that's a big red flag to start with. 100%. Good Th advice. Thanks for your time, Dan. Thanks for joining the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast. You're very welcome. Yeah, so, you know, one of the first things I that caught my eye, I mean, my ear, when I listen to the, to this was somebody contacts you in wh whichever form or you find a stock it, it really it's kind of you know it could be any method by which you f you come across the claim we're going to make you lots and lots of money in the short period of time and you know i think in this case they promised dan what was it like well six x your money in in the short amount of time and the it, you know, it's so fascinating because I too am, I mean, as all, let's put it this way, all humans want to make a lot quickly. And that's why this method works, right? Because when you hear it, and then they seem to provide the evidence of, and this is how it's going to happen, that longing we have for quick riches is very, very powerful. But, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's, but, uh, it's like one of those... If it's too good to be true, it probably, probably is. And, and for me, you know, we've just heard from Dan and uh, he tried to do his due diligence. You know, he checked these guys out. He had to go withdrawing money. He tried to make sure it was legit and and it looked solid to him on the way up. And that's how he got in so deep, you know, eventually for £10,000, like a good chunk of change there. Um, and yeah, it, like emotions are the things that, kind of lead you into bad investing decision making either i'm not saying dan was greedy but you know sometimes greed or fomo can be really dangerous emotions with when you manage your own portfolio you end up perhaps uh making investments or, or getting scared out of investments uh in a way that is just going to damage your long-term wealth and unfortunately you know that's happened to dan in this case right and this was an outright scam it was it was people deliberately misrepresenting things and running the playbook on human emotions to take advantage of vulnerable people. So that's why it's so nasty and horrible. But the greed point, Badger, is really important because I would say the largest mistaking in uh, mis the largest investing mistakes in my long career, in hindsight, have always revolved around greed. It was always a question of oversizing a position because I, I thought I knew more than the market or because I've done, you know, massive amounts of due diligence or be, it's some, some combination, some dangerous combination of confidence tied in with greed, you know, and it just ends badly most of the time. Yeah, you know, we've all been um, we've all been subject to these emotions. I've, me too. Right? I've had I've been overexposed to stocks in my own portfolio, um, 
and it becomes, I think your term you've used in the past is hopium, becomes part of your thesis, right? You're just kind of praying, let's, let's hope this thing comes good. Hey, look, C Limited in my own portfolio right now has taken yet another battering. Um, and I, I found myself, as I was reading this news article today about stuff happening in Indonesia, found myself shaking my head and saying, oh, maybe I need to like double down. That's just, that's greed. It's me trying to get myself mm -hmm. unstuck. But let's come back to the Dan situation because um, it's a little bit unique. And as you say, this wasn't a misjudged investment. This was just outright a scam co lying to him and mm -hmm. extracting his money. Um, and I do think there are some, even though Dan tried to do his due diligence, there's some red flags that you've got to be aware of. Like any investment scam that is offering to, let's say, double your money, let alone 6x your money in an unrealistic time frame, like that just doesn't add up. Risk and return go hand in hand. You can't get, you can't guarantee those riches. And if anybody tells you they're going to double your money, well, you're probably just as likely to lose all of your money at the same time. So got to be realistic. Like the market will deliver you, let's say, 9 to 10% annually. Some years much more, some years much less, some years you'll lose. On average, you're going to get about 9 to 10% in stocks. And if you do stock picking like we do, then you hope to beat that because otherwise why would you be doing it? And I'm, I kind of broadly double the market's return. I'm running at about 20, 21% over the last 20 years. Um, but you, you can't do much better than that without taking on just a significant level of risk. And this company clearly didn't make that clear to Dan. Yeah, there is another huge warning sign uh, <clears throat> I'm a fan of crypto, as as listeners will know, or will will know why in future episodes. But one of the, I would say, shadowy sides. It, it, sh well, let me say shadowy. It's it's. It, I kind of say this about technology. The technology itself is neutral. How it's used is where you get you get the varieties and degrees of issues. In this case, Dan was asked to pay using Bitcoin. And one of the reasons Bitcoin is a powerful technology is because it essentially makes all payments anonymous. It allows for an anonymous moving of currency. And so you ask, you, you would have to, I would want, the moment I, if I were in Dan's position, even if I had done my due diligence and then I'm told, well, we won't receive payment unless it's via Bitcoin, maybe because i'm familiar with that side of bitcoin that the reason it's powerful is because of anonymity i would say well why do these guys want to be an anonymous and that yeah. would probably be the end of my investment engagement with this company and i suppose a characteristic of crypto as well which is particularly beneficial for the scammers here not only is it potentially anonymous it's irreversible once a transaction has taken place it's not like you can take the guys to court and you know demand that the money gets refunded. It's uh, there's no way to withdraw that transaction once it's taken place unless they send the money back to you, which they did to sort of lure him in a bit deeper. You know, psychological techniques. Um, yeah, but, yeah. God, that was that was so insidious, Badger. Uh, the way I mean, that part of the playbook was you know just listen to it. It's so creepy where they let you win. It's sort of like a casino, actually, right? Like, uh, it felt like slot machines where, you know, they're programmed to let you win a little bit so that you keep coming back and then uh, you, you gain confidence. And then once you've been making some money, then they really pull the rug out from under you. Just nasty, yeah. nasty stuff. I felt so bad for him. Yeah. And then like, another red flag, and Dan looked into this, but I think he, he got sort of led along by them a little bit. Like this is not, this, this company is not regulated in the UK where we are uh, by the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority. And so Dan challenged them on that, as he should do, um, because you don't want to be giving your money to an unregulated company, like weird things can happen and you have no protections. And their response was, oh, you know, we're in a different market. We're regulated by a different regulator. The thing is, not all regulators are the same. And if you're operating in a mature market like the UK or like the US, You've got a high level of uh, reliability. There's hundreds of years um, and tons and tons of regulations that make it quite hard to run a financial services organization in these companies, in these countries. If you're running some like shadow bank or brokerage offshore somewhere, the Seychelles or wherever they were 
you know, who knows if they were even regulated, whatever they claim to be regulated, or well, the rules ain't the same and you don't get the same protections. So, and if you Google the company that Dan used now, top of the fold, you know, the first results are all scam company, but these guys probably changed their name every three or four months. So at the time when Dan started, and he did actually tell me, he, he Googled them, searched for them, it looked legit because they were using like a brand new brand right then. They're probably in the process of winding this one down now because their reputation's in tatters with that one, but they'll have the same operation up and running within a couple of days, no doubt, under a completely different brand name. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons I think it's really useful to belong to an investing community like Seven Investing, where you have five professional advisors who are on the Discord channel. We have company channels and and also uh, general channels, right? Imagine you're a beginning investor and you come across a new company. Well, we know all investing has inherent risk. So if you're going to go and do it alone, you're, you, you're potentially going to meet Dan's fate. Whereas, imagine you come across this kind of company, you could go on one of these channels and say, hey guys, I came across X, Y, and Z. Have, you, have any of you heard of them? They're promising 6x returns. And I, I, I would say if you had done that as an, as an investor, between the five professional advisors and or members of the community, everyone's ears, because they're not in that greed position, position of greed, would be like, whoa, 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 slow down. Hold on a second. Can you link us? Can you show us the site? And then... Uh, the cataclysm would have been avoided probably. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, if you wanted to join the Seven Investing Discord, you can get into the non-subscribers area for free. Just go check out the website, seveninvesting.com, and you'll find links there. And if you are uh, in early conversations with one of these companies and you think they might be a scam broker, yeah, dive in and then go find Christoph and myself there and we'd be happy to give you an opinion on that company you're looking at. Yeah, yeah and you know, right. before, we wrap, before we wrap this topic up, there is just one thing I said to Dan, be aware of, and I don't know if you've heard of this term, recovery scammers. You familiar with that? Mm -mm. Um, it's another level of hell. Basically, if you, uh, if you kind of come clean and you've been scammed in any way, um, there's like another whole stratosphere of scammers who will help you recover your money, get your money back. And they're just out to scam you just again. And they figure, oh, I've got a sucker here. I'm going to extract even more money from them. You know, hey, Dan, pay me a thousand dollars, thousand pounds, and I'll get your 10,000 pounds back. Just don't go there. Once it's gone, it's gone, um, unfortunately. Um, so if you've unfortunately been in a situation like Dan or, you know, any other scam situation, just be heightened awareness. Or maybe if a relative has, have a chat with them about recovery scammers and make sure they're aware. Yeah, this is a, a juicy topic. I'm glad you brought it up. Maybe the last thing I'll say is, is investing is risky, but it's also, I think, the wrong lesson to conclude that because there's risk in these waters that you should be risk averse and make a mistake by being overly, uh, not, not cautious, but overly fearful. There is a way to walk a balanced, to have a principle balanced approach to investing if you follow some of these guidelines that Badger and I are, are talking about and being in the community of other investors of good faith and goodwill is a huge step in that direction. So don't let the risk of investing permanently scare you out of the market. Find good people, good trustworthy people, uh, animals, badgers, monkeys, uh, what have you stay away from the hyenas and you'll be you'll be just fine good advice Christoph I think we had a uh, a good good chat there and if you've um if you go find us on Twitter um if you've been involved in anything like this or if you know of other fraud companies like that that are perhaps out trying to perpetrate the same kind of scams on other unwary newer investors let us know on Twitter right on all right Badger good seeing you we're on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms, so subscribe now, pound those, pound those buttons.
You can also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com, a starting point for those that know there's an intelligent and principled way to become wealthy and avoid getting scammed, but haven't yet found a good jungle guide. And as we mentioned, we are both lead advisors at 7investing.com, where you can find all kinds of deep dives and fundamental research into some of the most uh, appetizing investment opportunities out there. So uh, check out 7investing.com. Uh, you can find us both on X. Um, I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at number 7 Flying Platypus. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.